Hello again, I am Jared Case, Curator of Film Exhibitions at the Dryden Theatre in the George Eastman Museum with another streaming recommendation. And today we've got a very special guest with us. His name is Richard Edwards. He is the director of Excite at UC Riverside. He's also the co-author of The Maltese Touch of Evil with his partner Shannon Clute, who he was also the co-host of Out of the Past Investigating Film Noir podcast for about four years. And you may have seen him at the TCM Festival or uh, teaching online courses through TCM, please welcome Richard Edwards. Thanks, Jared. Great to be here today. Now, it, I looked back in our records. Do you realize it's been almost nine years since you've been here? <laughs> it has been, and that was a super fun night uh, for the audience to know. Uh, Jared invited Shannon Clute and I to a screening of the great Humphrey Bogart film, Dead Reckoning, at the wonderful uh, theater you guys have up at the Eastman um, Museum up in Rochester, New York, and you are correct. It That was a fabulous night, and it was great to see a full theater, something we don't see right now during COVID. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> uh, I understand that you've actually brought uh, two films for us to talk about today. Yes, yeah, so I had a couple different reasons for that. Um, the first one is I wanted to pick a film noir because that is my area of scholarly expertise. And back in the 1950s, it'd be very common to have a cartoon or a short before a movie. And so I found a short industrial film from 1954, which was made literally at the exact same time as the film I picked. And it helps contextualize the cultural anxieties that are part of the film. And the other reason why I picked two films is when you asked me to pick something that everyone could access during um, this time because we're doing everything virtual. I just wanted to do another pitch for one of my favorite film preservation efforts that's happening nationwide, which is that the Library of Congress with a lot of other great partnerships that they have do a thing called the National Film Registry where we have decided culturally to preserve some of our cinematic heritage. And every year, 25 films are nominated to go into basically our time capsule vault and are literally listed for preservation. And as I was looking through what they preserve, they don't just preserve Hollywood masterpieces. They preserve quirky films. They want the whole gamut and range of our visual register to be preserved. And so when I saw this delightful short called The House in the Middle, which is available to be streamed free at the Library of Congress, it's also on YouTube because it's in the public domain, um, I just thought it was delightful to share a brief 10 minute film you could watch before the film um, I picked to just set the mood. It's an appetizer for the main course. And it really sets a mood for the mid-50s and the sort of atmosphere that people were living in. Can you talk a little bit about what the film is about? Sure. So my two choices today, Jared, are a 1953 film by, directed by Ida Lupino called The Hitchhiker. And that was made with her independent production company that she started with her husband, uh, Collier Young. And the short that I picked, which has been preserved at the Library of Congress, is a film called The House in the Middle, The House in the Middle from 1954, which was sponsored by the National Paint, Varnish, and Lacquer Association, which to me is the greatest organization to do an industrial film of all time. <laughs> uh, didn't even know it existed. And what they did in this 10 minute short from 1954 is we were at the height of McCarthyism, the Cold War, and the nuclear threat, and there was a lot of atomic anxiety in American culture. And so The House in the Middle is a 10-minute short that argues to the American public that if you paint your house properly and you are a good housekeeper, it will protect you better against the fallout of a nuclear bomb attack than if you don't paint your house and if it's messy, and they literally have scenes of the house in the middle is the one painted with paints from this industrial association between two houses that are unpainted, 
and then they go out to the Nevada desert, and they this is actual stuff that the U.S. military did, and they detonated an atomic bomb, and then they studied, and the house that actually had paint on it did withstand the blast a little bit better. But it's just that crazy, though. I mean, this is a film designed to convince the American public that good housekeeping mm -hmm. was going to protect you against nuclear fallout. So it, it does a couple different things we can talk about briefly. I do encourage people to watch it because my intention would be this is the short, it's only 10 minutes long that you watch before you watch The Hitchhiker to set the mood. It tells you how authorities were thinking about 1954 and the cultural imagination. And it's really trying to quell anxiety, but in a very weird way, which is the most American thing, most American thing that you can do is to protect your house and it says a line that I think informs um, the hitchhiker. So there's a line in the film that I love, which is that a house that is neglected is a house that is doomed. Mm. And that actually could be on the poster for the hitchhiker. So like, while it might be a little bit of a stretch to talk about an atomic bomb demonstration video done by a painting association to sell paint to the serial killer narrative of the hitchhiker i really think the crossover shows you how the cinematic record has all these clues if we watch and read carefully for how to understand what's happening in culture at the time and that idea that a house that is neglected is a house that is doomed is basically where we will enter into the story with uh, The Hitchhiker. And it also sort of emphasizes, uh, just based on imagining the audience is going to be watching this, the, the powerlessness that people were feeling at the time that, you know, even if I can do something like pick up the house or, uh, you know, paint the, paint the house or the fence and clean up the yard, that's something that I can do to sort of help the cause or to keep my family safe. But I think it also, interestingly, uh, as we go into The Hitchhiker, it reinforces uh, sort of gender roles at the time that you know, even the, the housewife who is home and is not bringing home the money has a job to do. And that is her job to do to make sure that the house is picked up while the man goes out and either you know, makes the money or if he's got a weekend off, he can go fishing somewhere in the Mexican desert. Exactly. And that's the other key part there, Jared, is the last thing you just said, the Nevada desert. Because one of the things I want to set up for the audience before we get to the hitchhiker and why I also picked the house in the middle and your observation on gender roles is spot on because we're going to have a very interesting discussion about gender roles in the hitchhiker as well, is this idea of the setting of the desert in the 1950s. And you would say, well, why are Jared and Richard talking about the desert? We know what film noir is. Film noir <laughs> is the dark urban alleys. It is possibly the most urban genre that really relies on the image of the city. One can always remember the beginning of the great film noir, The Naked City. You know, we're <laughs> here in the Naked City where there's eight million stories at our disposal. And yet, in 1953 and 1954, the desert becomes an increasingly powerful signifier of American culture. Now, part of this is, I think, part of the atomic bomb anxieties. We got used to the desert and seeing images as part of our culture of these mushroom clouds ascending in the Nevada and New Mexico deserts. And the other area is someone like Ida Lupino, is telling in The Hitchhiker a story very much of these other aspect of noir, which is noir is about the borderlands. It's the, the border between order and chaos, between civilization and barbarity, between um, law and order and criminality and evil. And the desert is in the Southwest of the United States, that liminal zone that zone that as you pass from, you really have a very interesting narrative palette 
for Ida Lupino and her actors to work on. And so that was the other reason I picked The House in the Middle is it's not as strange in hindsight, 60 years later, to really re realize that film noirs can be set anywhere. Mm -hmm. and that back in 1953, that'd be a much more controversial statement than it is today. And that the desert turns out to be a great um, proving ground for this thesis is something I think that The Hitchhiker is correctly lauded for now, retrospectively. The Hitchhiker is one of those classic films, Jared, that at the time got mixed reviews. If you read the New York mm -hmm. Times review of The Hitchhiker, it was called out for its acting and its setting, but was criticized for being of predictable plot. So at the time, there was a lot of credit given to certain aspects of it, but it wasn't as glowing. In retrospect, the film noir canon sees it as a masterpiece now. Scholars since the 1970s have returned to it for many different reasons. And I just want to set up one thing before we jump into our discussion of The Hitchhiker. It's important for the audience to know that during this period we're talking about, the period of film noir in Hollywood mostly stretches in most historical accounts from the Maltese Falcon in uh, the early 1940s to Touch of Evil in the late 1950s. And it's about a 15 year time frame where these dark, unusual um, films start to percolate. And you know, many people now are very familiar with the highlights of the film noir canon, such as Double Indemnity, The Killers, Out of the Past, Sunset Boulevard, films like that. The Hitchhiker is part of that tradition. It's considered a later film noir because it's happening in 1953. Mm -hmm. um, the, high, the high point of noir is really 47 to 50 are really when most of the great masterworks are done. So by the time Lupino is doing it, there's just a couple things I want to set up for the audience. One, Ida Lupino is considered the only woman in the Hollywood system to direct a film noir. And so that's worth bearing repeating. So film noir tended to be dominated by uh, male production personnel. So while we are very familiar with the femme fatale as a very important role and a gender inversion for women in many ways, and that has been widely discussed in film noir history, the importance of female representation on screen, Pino does something very important. She's changing the power dynamics behind the camera. Mm. Um, she started a independent production company called Filmmakers Inc. with her husband, Collier Young, and they decided back in the early 50s at the start of the breakdown of the studio system um, that happens in the late 1940s because the Supreme Court rules that Hollywood studios are a monopoly practice in a thing called the Paramount Decree. And the film industry slowly starts to move away from its absolute and utter control of all of the filmmaking apparatus from production to distribution and exhibition. So for example, I apologize for the history lesson, but you know, <laughs> MGM not only made its own films, it shipped them to theaters that they owned. And it really created um, a setup where there were major studios, there were five of them, MGM, Paramount, um, Warner Brothers, RKO, and I'm forgetting the fifth. Um, um, and then the miners like Universal and Columbia and so forth. In the 50s, independent production companies started to crop up and you saw it in all sorts of ways. Um, in film noir, some of my favorites were like independents like uh, Humphrey Bogart's Santana film company named after his boat, where he started to make films that were personal projects of his. Ida Lupino and her husband fit in with this. And so they, part of this long digression in the film history is to set up The Hitchhiker as a B film. It was not a major film, made for a budget of approximately $100,000 on a 24-day shooting schedule, which was short in the 50s for what was considered a mainstream film. And you'll see all the hallmarks of independent production and B filmmaking in The Hitchhiker. But this was the brainchild of Ida Lupino. 
she wanted control behind the camera and she wanted to tell stories ripped from today's headlines. So her production company, Filmmakers Inc., made a handful of films and, you know, and by a handful, I mean five or six films total. And they all basically were ripped from the headlines types of stories. Now this is very common. We see this on television series all the time. In 1953, this was much less common. And so I do all this to set up because I think it's important in a film like The Hitchhiker to occasionally watch it the way an audience would greet it in the 1950s. It definitely wouldn't have gotten broad theatrical distribution in major movie palaces because those were still being, for the most part, controlled by the majors. So it would play the other houses in many towns, second run theaters, and I'll avoid that history lesson for right now. <laughs> but most, most major places had, like we do today, choices of where to go see theaters, but which theater you picked would often dictate what film you were seeing. So the issue of a wide release was not the same as it is today. And they found a niche. They found that these stories that were very compelling were going to sell tickets because it was the sensationalism. And then the final part about the film is just to set up and then we can jump into um, how you wanna talk about the film is it also was a pet project of Ida Lupino because she actually met, it was based on not only a real life story, but it was based on an actual drifter who murdered people in the early 1950s. And Ida Lupino actually interviewed two of the surviving victims of this serial killer and was so impressed with their stories that she took this script about this story and actually included information uh, in the actual drama of the piece from her firsthand discussions with people who dealt with um, this type of actual living menace um, at the time. And so I think all that helps if you know that when you go in to see this film, because it really restores the film to its originality. Um, because a lot of these tropes have been beaten to death um, over the last 60 years, which means two things. One, films like this are that influential, that they're copied and they spur the creative acts of other people that come after them. But also, number two, I think it's really important to meet films on their own terms. Another film that I think you really have to meet on its own terms, one of my absolute favorite films noir of all time, um, Edgar Ulmer's Detour, mm -hmm. you know, was made for 40% of the budget of this film. But if you don't know these things, you can sometimes feel like, well, why is this so different? Well, it's different because the Edgar Olmers and the Ida Lupinos of the world were telling personal stories at a fraction of the Hollywood budgets, but that gave them the freedom to be the storytellers they wanted to be. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on a couple of different things that uh, you said and just uh, see if I can synthesize them. So we were talking about uh, the, the budget and the budget constraints, particularly before we, we started recording about how that may have uh, prompted Lupino to use this desert setting, which you say both the films uh, are using, and that the film noir is mostly uh, urban tales, and the, the landscape of the, the urban setting is that there are very defined roles, right? There's two sides of the street. There's the good side and the bad side, or you go around a corner and it creates these um, dark, dark alleys that, that people go down and they can hide in, whereas in the desert, it's, it's all the same, and there's, there's almost no place to hide. And uh, relating the characters to the landscape in, in film noir, most of the time when you're talking about an urban landscape, you, you have the, the good guys and the bad guys, and maybe they cross the street and that's what, what causes the plot. Here, all of the guys are on the same landscape, they're all in the sun, and they're, they're very much on an even plane. Whereas, um, with, with film noir, we often are following someone who transgresses in some way. And the, the roles that both the histories of our heroes, the two men who are kidnapped, you know, they, they may have been soldiers in the past, or they've gone to war and they've come back, but now they're not necessarily acting like soldiers. Whereas uh, our kidnapper, who is obviously evil from the beginning, also has a past with, in which he was not that person at the beginning. So they've both gone through changes. 
No, I absolutely love that. So where we're set for this film is the border between Southwest US and Mexico. And most of this film takes place in the Mexico borderlands between the United States and um, there's actually, uh, this is very much cartographic cinema, there's literal <laughs> maps in this film. And so you're constantly watching um, maps, not only do the, uh, 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 not so, so let me set up the movie very briefly. So the movie, so, cause these are such great points, but I want maybe to have a little bit of a, a narrative um, um, uh, moment with no spoiler alerts, just how the film sets up. The film starts with an opening uh, credits crawl that talks about this being the true story of a man, a gun, and a car. Now, you and I, as movie aficionados and film noir fans, know that that is just Godardian to its extreme, like just boil the genre down to its three elements, a man, a gun, and a car. You know you're in a noir, you almost don't need any other narrative descriptions. And it's based on the same thing that we now see all the time in movies. This is, the facts are real. You know, the last line of the credit crawl is the facts are actual. So it's trying to play off of this dragnet sort of vibe. You know, every story you're about to see is real. And in the 1950s, this was the gag of the police procedural dragnet, that this is like from the literal case files of um, criminal history. The film opens with a very dynamic gesture to the very dawn of cinema. Um, it opens with a gun being pointed at the audience. This is reminiscent of the early silent film short, The Great Train Robbery, where it also opens with a shot of a gun being pointed at the cinema. Very much this moment of the cinema of attractions, this visceral, powerful thing. So if you're gonna tell me this is a movie about a man, a gun, and a car, Ida Lupino instantly points the gun right at the audience, and it's a very powerful opening. It's widely imitated. Um, it was highly original in the sense of it's an homage by Lopino, but it's also very uh, cutting edge, done in really chiaroscuro lighting. The gun is just very much poking out of an inky, dark uh, void. Um, and it's a masterful shot that was shot by the house DP, director of photography of RKO Pictures, the brilliant uh, Nicholas Musaraka. Um, who lensed many of my favorite films noir. I mean, Nicholas Musaraka did not find a crime film that he did not want to ecstatically uh, bathe in glorious um, shadows. And this film starts by showing just the criminal whose name is Emmett Myers um, from the, uh, uh, played by William Tallman, from the waist down and he's going on a criminal spree. So you're starting to think maybe this is a Bonnie and Clyde type of story, um, but it's called The Hitchhiker. So you're wondering like how that starts to come in and I'm still only 30 seconds into the film. Right now. <laughs> and um, what happens is then there are two military buddies, um, Edmund O'Brien, who goes by the name of Roy and Frank Lovejoy, who goes by the name of Gilbert are just, leaving their families, their wives and their kids for a weekend getaway to go fishing. So they're driving um, to go to the mountains in New Mexico, but then they decide they're going to go maybe on a slight adventure and they go further south to a town called San Felipe in Mexico. And this is where they start to deviate from this um, middle-class mores that would be a signal to the audience, uh-oh, they're making a morally ambiguous choice right now. Mm -hmm. And the coding in 1953 would have been very clear. Um, my favorite moment in the San Felipe sequence is when they're going through the downtown and there's neon signs lit up, very reminiscent again, what we'll see four years later in Orson Welles' Touch of Evil, which also uses a Mexico border town, but Lapino got there first a person comes up to the car to try to sell them on the Sin City aspects of San Felipe. So don't 
miss that one of the things they're being offered is the famous fan dance. Yeah. And you know, we got to remember in 1950s coding, that is pure erotica. I mean, that might sound tame by 2020 standards. That was eroticism um, that the audience would have instantly coded as these guys are, they have wives, they should be turning the car around and going to the fishing hole. This is not what they should be doing. So I think it's important to share with the audience that that opening scene in San Felipe that introduces Edmund O'Brien and Frank Lovejoy is to inject into the narrative that they are doing morally ambiguous activities. And, and they do allow us in the script to know that uh, they both have wives. Um, the character of Gilbert um, has kids as well. And they're supposed to be going on just a fishing weekend, but they decide they're going to kind of go on a guy's adventure. And we can, of course, understand how all that's coded. And then they meet William Tallman's character of Emmett Myers as a hitchhiker. And then you get this amazing car ride that's one of my favorite um, shots in film noir. Um, it's something Shannon and I spent a lot of time talking about when we did a podcast on Hitchhiker back in 2007 is, you know, you're so used in the Hollywood studio system to these cars that are just on studio back lots where you're just in a fake car and a rear screen projection through the back window. And you're just used to seeing actors pretend drive. Um, and this is, this was an aesthetic fully accepted by the Hollywood studio system. Audiences accepted it as real. Um, my favorite practitioner of fake car driving is Alfred Hitchcock, who I mm. think fake car drives the greatest of all the uh, directors because he embraced the artifice of it and made the fake more real than the real. Um, <laughs> but, I digress. Um, but in this great sequence with the three actors in the car, the villain is in the back seat. The head, Musaraka frames it beautifully, completely in shadow. And we see the second emergence of the gun and it emerges poking out of the back seat. And as Emmett Myers, the character leans forward um, using theatrical lighting that wouldn't have been out of place in a universal monster picture from 10 years earlier, you get the uplit um, spotlight from below to accentuate the menace of Emmett Till, I mean, of Emmett Myers, who has an amazing bit of prosthetic acting, which is that the left eye of the character is partially closed and deformed, which will become a narrative plot point later in the film. And then we're off to the races. And then for the next 65 minutes of the film, it's a white knuckle ride of how will this dynamic in the desolation of the desert with a man, a gun, and a car play out where a serial killer, killer has two, two army, army buddies buddy. um, as, as hostages hostage. on, you know, and where, and where will this lead to? Yeah, and it's amazing how, how fruitful this, uh, this film is, because even as we're talking, I'm, I'm coming up with things, and you're reading that text from the beginning of the film to me, talking about a man, a gun, and a car. Those are three things that, that the film lists right off the bat. There are also three men uh, in that car. So obviously Emmett is the gun and Roy is the car. He's the mechanic who's the one that's always driving, which leaves Gil to be the man. And what that says about his actions or his inaction throughout the rest of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's, it's almost, I mean, it's a very straight line, the narrative that it takes because it is, basically these these men spending so much time together over four or five days and you know you can see them not shower that they they age and that their their beards continue to grow and they the, the acting shows them becoming weary and tense as, as the situation continues to move on and their uh, interaction with each other changes based on this this tension uh you know the uh, Emmett needs to show more force as, as he goes on in order to maintain that control, whereas Roy tends to be breaking down and he just wants to get out of this. And Gil is the one who is patient and he's the one that says, 
We're not going to act until he acts. Uh, we're not going to risk ourselves just to get out of this. We're, we're going to stand this until he makes a move that we can take advantage of. Absolutely. And I love your reading there because I think you're right that that is decoding because um, once and, and, and all of the various inversions of it, once, you know, one of the things just because, you know, um, we start to think about how all of these narrative elements are put into play in typical fashion in most films, then pay attention, as you said, to how um, uh, the character of um, Gil and Gilbert, I mean, Gil is challenged in terms of his masculinity and then pay attention to how um, the character of Roy is challenged for his mechanistic thinking. And then think about how um, Emmett is challenged for his um, use of violence. I mean, so you're right that thematically, it's only those three elements. I and mean, there doesn't need to be a spoiler alert. I mean, what happens like with all great movies, you just need this shove of the right elements and just watching the physics of this universe play out as these atoms bounce off of each other. And the part that's just so much fun, and I always do this call out when I get a chance to talk about films to um, broader audiences, is the more you watch films noir, the more you can pick up on all of the subtle variations on set pieces within film noir. And as I was watching The Hitchhiker this time, in preparation for our chat, Jared, I picked up on something I didn't pick up on when I was talking about this with Shannon almost 12 years ago, which is this fascinating set piece early in the film. So again, no spoiler alert, where there's a marksmanship competition where um, Emmett, uh, so it's clear that part of the masculinity battle between um, um, the masculinity battle between Gil and Emmett between the villain and one of the uh, one of the army buddies is on this issue of who's better with a gun, who's the more accurate marksman. Now, what I wasn't thinking about 12 years ago is this time, for whatever reason, it turned out to me to be the nightmare inversion of a similar scene from Gun Crazy. Gun <laughs> Crazy also uses prowess with a gun but in Gun Crazy, they use it as a mating ritual between um, the two lead characters. Here, it's the exact same type of scene, but done for menace. Like, what's so great about film noir is I'm sure all these directors are getting inspired by other directors. And Lupino takes a scene of marksmanship and literally changes the level of implied danger and how we feel. And what's interesting is my visceral concern in The Hitchhiker is much higher than my visceral concern in Gun Crazy. In Gun Crazy, those lit matches that are being triggered um, out of the uh, gun um, of the marksman is amazing, but it really is done as a mode of flirtation. Here, um, <clears throat> Lupino, plays it for all of its angst. And, and just that simple inversion is the reason why you gotta keep watching 10,000 films. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, uh, this is what we gotta do with our time. The more you watch these films, the more you'll start to see how they echo and inspire each other. And to bring in the, the short that we were talking about, uh, the idea of having this program that's put together uh, and having them both set in the desert, even though what they're talking about in the short is is home you know that place where you belong and how safe you can be there particularly if you are attuned to taking care of it whereas these two men who get into trouble not only do they go away from their home but they go far afield from where they had planned to go so the further you get from home the more dangerous it is for you particularly in this time period and that paranoia uh, about the, the nuclear age and what that could actually mean is also reflected in the hitchhiker in terms of you know going far from that home is what what could happen to you when you don't know where you are or you don't know the people that you're interacting with oh and I, and and one of the things that I absolutely love about this film is 
it is set in Mexico. And as they go farther and farther down the road, and in many ways, it's a road film, it's a proto road film in many ways. Um, there's a lot of interactions with um, small little towns in Mexico where they have to stop for gasoline or to get food or occasionally even bump into police, um, bump into the police. And it's all done in Spanish with no attempt to have subtitles or translation because Ido Lupino wants this world to be alien. Um, and we're not, and I mean that in a very, um, you know, uh, um, academic sense of it not wanting to feel like a U.S. homestead. It wants to feel that we're not in the United States anymore, and we want to feel this difference, this ability of this landscape to be a deformation, as you say, of the homestead. And that is, I think, that echoing between those two films. And I just love that you brought that back up again, because this is the risk there's two risks. One is not properly maintaining your home. The other is wandering too far from it. And right. both of those are going to be punished in film noir. And I just think, you know, uh, the more you sometimes recognize that film noir is always the negative fairy tale of what happens when you wander too close from home, you know, when you wander too far from home, it's the inverse, it's the nightmare version of the classic Hollywood tale. Because the classic Hollywood tale is the confirmation of American values, the value of marriage, the value of community, the value of law and order. And the other part of that that I know, you know is always tough, especially if people are just starting to get into this period in film, this is also during the era of censorship. And so Ida Lupino is still going to need a seal. And so she cannot show complete lawless acts yet in a film that wants to be shown theatrically in the United States without having some sort of condemnation of this bad behavior. But one of the reasons I love film noir is Lupino rides a razor's edge on the code in this film. Mm -hmm. go as far as she can without breaking the code. But one of the things and I learned this, you know, in some of my conversations with Eddie Muller, who runs Noir Alley over on TCM, you know, you got to be careful when you're watching. This is one of the points Eddie always makes. You got to be careful when you're watching films under censorship because they are constantly talking about stuff that you got to just be hip to. And if you're not hip to it, you might think like it's watered down. It's not. Ida Lupino and the screen, and she did the screenplay with her husband. The, this is a very challenging film that if you're watching it for subtext, you really will recognize that the constraints of censorship did not dull the vision, it sharpened it. Yeah, in, in that same terms of subvert, subversion and going back to what you brought up about the uh, Spanish being uh, spoken in the Mexican towns, uh, is that the, the one person that has that advantage over uh, the kidnapper is Gil. He's, he's the man of that triptych, and he's the one that actually has the knowledge of Spanish and can communicate with the, the people in the towns, and it's a, a weakness that, uh, that the kidnapper has that, that he significantly feels, and it's, it is Gil, the one, you know, the, the man, uh, if we can complete that, that analogy, the, the one whose experience is actually the saving grace. He's the one that is able to keep them safe uh, throughout this ordeal up until the end when he confronts uh, the, the kidnapper and knocks the gun out of his hand. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the other part that I want to just, again, um, share with this audience is it does bring in, so what breaks the road trip thematic is there is a second layer of the police procedural. And so anyone who saw another B film that I highly recommend, which is also free online, He Lives by Night, um, which um, does a lot of these same things in a very different register using the um, urban jungle as opposed to the desert, but a lot of parallels between The Hitchhiker and He Lives by Night. But this idea of the police procedural is very, very fascinating because 
The other thing that, again, you know, when you watch a lot of films, you start to see patterns. The opening of the house in the middle is, again, aerial photography to show the desert at a high relief. And one of the ways we help get establishing shots of the vastness of the um, desert that they are in is police helicopters and police planes. And you constantly get this sense of, in this period, the police officers are always at a slight disadvantage. One of the things I have always found fascinating about film noir is film noir is always highly skeptical about the potential of this type of criminality to be contained. And one of the things that I always find so this uncomfortable about The Hitchhiker is you never get a sense that all of this apparatus, all of these attempts to save Gil and Roy are gonna matter because the menace in society has been unleashed. It's not containable. There's no jail that's going to make us feel comfortable once monsters like Emmett Myers are out there. And, and it is this monster that starts and is lurking in the shadows and that doesn't ever seem to fully be asleep. I mean, the part that I think is eerie if you watch this film in the right frame of mind is Myers, the villain, is never fully awake and is never fully asleep. He's again himself in some type of middle zone of just this constant threat that can't be contained. That's where I then, for the audience, if you want to, we could just put a credit alert right here. Uh, Richard Edwards about to engage in overreading, but uh, <laughs> we can put a alert up. But it's that uncontainable menace of the serial killer that I do think is coded as the atom bomb in the 1950s. That's how I read it. As we start to get more and more anxious that we can't withstand an atomic blast, these this, this villainy that seems to come deep out of the eruption of some type of post-war trauma is also uncontainable. And that's again where I think the coding of the desert, you start to see a film boiled down and I love that we keep going back to just these core elements. It's a short film, it's only 71 minutes long, not much longer than an episodic TV show, but it's a full tale of just basically three objects that are intended to see how they play out in this space of lawlessness and villainy. And that's what I love about it. And, and Lupino is very smart to something, you know, again, films are very complex art forms. Pay attention to the score music. The score is a lovely score. Um, I'm a big fan of it. Um, because it lives in my head for several days after, because um, uh, she does this great sound effects of the rumble of the car with this RKO score that uh, plays as a leitmotif uh, for the entire film. But when there's no score, so much of these interactions between the three men are done silently. It's, it, this is a carefully modulated film of glances, of subtle movements. And what's great about controlled films like this is that it means then every jerk of the head has an impact because everything becomes so still and focused. The most minor acting technique has great resonance. And I, again, tip my hat, especially to uh, Frank Lovejoy and Edmund O'Brien. Um, Edmund O'Brien's a film noir favorite from his starring role in another great film noir, DOA. We I mean, can do this all day long. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, they actually are contained. There's not a lot of overacting in this film. It's very buttoned down acting. It's not particularly method. And um, I, I really enjoy um, that. And it's also... Um, another thing I'll give a shout out for with Ida Lupino is not only was she brilliant in how she directed these actors, her script is phenomenally economical. This is the type of story where it is so easy, in my opinion, and uh, we could, you and I could probably come up with dozens of examples of overwritten films like this where there's too much of an attempt to give it a moral, 
too much of an attempt for the relationship between Gil and Roy to be spelled out, too much of an attempt to give Emmett a backstory, too much of an attempt for the crime solvers to have more importance than they need to have, too much importance on the landscape, too much importance on the, um, everything just feels properly modulated. So one of the things I sometimes talk about in films like this is it's like a piece of music where there's no false notes. Like when you just listen to a song that just feels like it's just all right out there. Um, there's not, there's no real fat in this film that I would um, cut out. And the other uh, part, just again, to encourage people to watch lots of others uh, films noir is this has my second fastest resolution. My favorite fast resolution is detour, which just literally in 30 seconds. Uh, moves the needle of the whole plot. Um, th this takes 45 seconds um, to resolve it. Like you watch a film the whole time and you know, just pay attention to the ending. But films noir um, understand that it's the journey, not the destination. So that when these films finally get to their destination, don't be disappointed because Ida Lupino has made a very important point that the movie was about the journey not about its resolution. And I think we sometimes lose that. This is a great journey film into the heart of darkness of what humanity was feeling on the um, beginning of the atomic era during a period of great xenophobia in the United States. And artists like Ida Lupino picking a story ripped from the day's headlines was trying to show uh, the American public um, a side of our lived reality that we do sometimes have to expose in order to deal with it, as opposed to just sweeping it under the rug. And I think that is a beautiful point to end on. Uh, as you said, we could do this for hours, uh, but nobody's gonna sit in front of their computer and watch uh, us talk for hours. So uh, thank you so much, Rich, for uh, bringing both of these films uh, to our attention. As you say, they are streaming online uh, both on YouTube and on the Library of Congress website, as they are both part of the National Film Registry. Uh, and George Eastman Museum is proud to have a couple of films that we've preserved and, and saved on the registry ourselves. So uh, we're very happy and, and we support that. And any, any awareness that we can bring to film preservation, uh, even at this time, uh, the, the films are still deteriorating, whether we're going outside or not. So <laughs> thank you again, Rich. It's, it's been a fantastic time to talk to you uh, as always. And um, please, and if, if we have more time, we can do another one of these. Uh, I love that. Absolutely, I, as you can tell, I always love to talk about films. And I just wanna encourage everyone, please go watch these. The other thing about uh, The Hitchhiker is because it's in the public domain, if you have a streaming service like Amazon Prime, it's also available there. So you can actually watch it on your TV set as well for free if you have these services. So this is not a hard film to find. It's in the public domain. Thanks again. This is Rich Edwards, who is coming to us from UC Riverside. And please uh, return again. Uh, we've got some more streaming recommendations for you. So stay tuned.